Hello again. In this video, we'll be talking about planning for public transport. We will not talk about the quantitative aspects of planning, so don't worry, there are no calculations we'll be making, but rather look at it from an implementation perspective. If this is the first time that you are seeing my face, then my name is Sunny Kodukula, and I work as a senior researcher at the Wuppertal Institute. And I've been working with cities in emerging economies for the past 16 years in conceptualizing, planning, and implementing sustainable urban mobility. I will share with you some of the lessons learned from experience and from the existing body of knowledge and research on public transport planning from a policy and a design perspective. If this topic is of your interest, then don't forget to read the public transport related reading lists for this section. Also, I'll be using the terms transit or public transport to refer to public transport. In this video, they mean the same, but if you think they are different, feel free to share your thoughts in the discussion. So before we jump into what to keep in mind when we plan for public transport, let's ask ourselves why we need public transport. As we have seen in other videos of this section and in the previous sections, our main goal is to plan and implement sustainable urban mobility. Public transport is one of the key pillars for implementing sustainable mobility. This is because it is a mode that moves large number of people compared to personal motorized transport where one vehicle can move maximum five people if it's a car and two people if it's a motorcycle. Public transport, say, for example, a bus can move up to 60 people. When we see per capita emissions, that is emissions per person using uh, the vehicle, public transport is a lot cleaner compared to conventional personal motorized modes. Public transport also comes in various forms or flavors. In many cities, it is in the form of buses. Some cities may have a metro rail, a monorail, a tram, uh, underground, suburban rail, or a bus rapid transit system, or a combination of all of these. We will not get into the details which of these modes is better, as that is outside the scope of our discussion. When we implement properly and in the right urban setting, any of these modes can show their true potential. Here is a thought experiment. Take a few seconds to close your eyes and think about the things that make you use or not use public transport in your city. Let's start the timer now. Now that the time is up, if you want, you can write the points down on a sheet of paper for your reference later. You can also share what you thought in the discussion board below. In many of our cities, public transport is not very effective. There are various reasons and two of the most common ones are the way we literally see public transport, that is, the image is not a pleasant one. In many cities, public transport is also run by private operators under a permit from the government. The fares are usually decided by the government, and the governments try to keep the fares often low through subsidies with the notion that public transport is accessible for the poor. The operators have to then meet their costs from ticket sales. This is also called the fare box revenue. When the fares are kept low and no incentives are provided, there will be a gap between the costs and the income. To meet their costs, the operators reduce the quality of the service that they provide and the reduction in the quality translates into infrequent buses crowding on some routes and poor quality of vehicle. This process overall reduces the image of public transport, thereby reducing the ridership or the number of people using public transport. This further pushes the revenues down. At this point, the quality of the whole system is deteriorated and the overall ridership is eventually at stake. And this is the vicious cycle of public transport. The other problem is how we plan. Usually in many of our cities, the decision makers decide on the technology for the transportation system first. This is usually expressed as we need a metro rail or a light rail or a BRT system to solve our traffic problems. This decision could be because of the influence from either the manufacturing lobby or by trying to replicate the successes from other cities. A new technology or a new transit system often comes with additional cost and to meet the initial cost a smaller system is implemented. Depending on the technology used, the subsidies and or the fares for the system are impacted. 
The users need to adjust themselves to the new technology and those who find the system cumbersome make a switch to personal motorized modes when they have a choice. And those who use the system express their dislike to others, which can create a negative image. This brings us back again to the vicious cycle that we saw earlier. And there is a way around to this kind of planning. Cities like Zurich, Frankfurt, Vienna, Tokyo, Hong Kong and Singapore have high shares of public transport and they stay steady. These cities are also called transit cities. The key to the success of planning transit systems is to keep the users as the focus. Understanding user needs through surveys and consultations provide feedback on the current public transport system. It is ideal if these surveys are done by an independent or a neutral entity Surveys should also include the perspective of personal motorized users on public transport. This gives a chance for the city and the public transport agency to know why they are unable to gain new customers. Stakeholder consultations involving other entities, for example, from civil society organizations is extremely helpful as there will be cases where some data or analysis on public transport is unavailable with the city or the transport agencies and is available with these stakeholders. And different insights are certainly helpful to the city to decide on the kind of public transportation to implement. Based on the user feedback, the city and the transit agency can identify elements that match with their long-term strategy and vision. Based on this evaluation and the available resources with the city, a decision can then be made either to implement an entirely new system or tweak the current system to fit the needs of the majority of the users. In many cases, if there is an existing transit system in a city, it can be adapted to fit the user's needs rather than implementing a new expensive system. In either case, we come back to the needs of the people at the center and how they influence the planning process. Experience from transit cities and studies on public transport show that there are some important needs or demands, if you will, of, public, uh, of people when they want to use public transportation. Here, you may want to compare these with the list from our thought experiment earlier. There could be some topics that match the points that encourage or discourage your public transportation use. So the needs or demands are, the first is destination. This means that people want to know if the public transportation system goes to where they want to go. Second is convenience. This means that people want to use public transport when they want and they need to be able to easily change their travel plans and expect that they continue their travel reasonably with transit. Third, duration. This is the duration of the entire trip from the moment they leave the doorstep and the time they reach their final destination, including the time taken to wait. Fourth is do they get what they paid for? In other words, is the transit system economical to use? Fifth, how are they treated as a customer and how they feel while using public transport? What amenities do they have as a public transport user? In simple words, respect is shown through transit quality and the safety. Sixth is reliability or trust in public transportation operations. Is the system going to be on time? If it is delayed, are they being made aware of the delays and etc. For a motorist, the journey experience starts from the doorstep. That is them getting into the parked car at their home. Similarly, for a public transport user, the same is true. They need to get to the transit stop or station. So it is usually either a walking or a cycling trip. The distance they need to walk to get to the station and the condition of the infrastructure to get there makes an important difference. The same applies when they get to their final destination. So when we plan transit in cities, density and the kind of land use play an important role and having transit stops in residential neighborhoods and in places where people shop or work can enrich the experience. 
as people know that the most frequent destinations can be easily reached. And simple and direct routes are easier for users. Using technology through transit apps can greatly benefit in finding which route to take to get to the destination and plan their journey accordingly. When we talk about convenience, it means how often does the transit work and when does the transit run? The how often part relates to frequency of the transit and when does the transit run influences the flexibility. Frequency is something that personal motor users cannot easily comprehend. This is because they have their motor vehicles accessible at all times. This is not the case for public transport users. They have to match their start time with the public transport availability. Now imagine if there is a service that operates only once every hour. Even if it is a high speed service, it does not make much sense as the time taken to wait for transit is long. So in this case, speed has no value. Yet, it is true that increasing frequency can increase the costs of operation as the number of vehicles that are needed to run may increase. For this, there could be better transit service options such as express service, limited stop services and regular services. And when planning timetables, it is better to plan using clock times, example every 15 minutes or every 30 minutes. And this makes it easier for users to plan their journeys. Having a system with an exclusive right of way for uh, buses, for example, uh, can be uh, beneficial for operating transit because an exclusive bus lane or a physically segregated bus lane can make the journey faster as cars and motorcycles might be stuck in condition and exclusive lanes beat the condition and this shows priority for the transit user. This segregation can also reflect the reality when planning for express services. And having simple grids will enable users to get from anywhere to anywhere with one connection and increase their convenience and also help in frequency as it will be easier to connect routes when a transit grid is created. The second part of convenience is flexibility. Flexibility in transit relates to the hours of operation and the network that transit provides. If transit services is, uh, operates only for eight hours a day, then users who depend on transit do not have transit for the remaining 16 hours or remaining eight hours if you count for sleep. Having night buses can increase this flexibility of transit use. Many cities offer 15 or more hours of transit services. Hong Kong, for example, has 19 hours metro rail services. When this is combined with shared mobility and intermediate uh, public transport or paratransit, the flexibility is further improved. And integrating transit modes can be a very good option if your city has multiple forms of transit. Duration, in simple words, is how long does it take to reach the destination. Duration includes the time taken to reach the station, the waiting time, the travel time, and the time taken from the end station to reach the final destination. While creating transit grids, direct connections, express services, and right-of-way, uh, as we have seen earlier, can reduce travel time, the waiting time can also be reduced by providing amenities at train stations and creating connection stations and interchanges with other services. This gives a chance for the transit user to do multiple activities within their trip. This also avoids additional trips. For example, having a transit stop at shopping locations and embedding transit stops within multi-use buildings can reduce the waiting times at stops. In addition, planning transit together with urban planning can also have other positive externalities. Example, finding additional funding opportunities for operating and expanding transit. In simple terms, economical means that users perceive that the fare that they pay corresponds to the service and quality of transit that they receive. People might be paying higher fares for better transit systems 
or for traveling longer distances. Another option is having integrated fares, which we will discuss more about later in this uh, video. But the gist is that with one fare, users can reach their destinations irrespective of the number of modes that they need to use to reach their destination. And one important thing to remember is the comparison of the single journey transit fare with the parking price. And it is suggested that the parking price should be higher than the transit fare, especially in key destinations such as shopping districts or central business districts, because this will deter the use of personal motorized modes if the parking is higher than the transit fares. <clears throat> With respect to transit, in many of our cities, there is a perception that transit is unsafe, especially for vulnerable groups. We need to ask ourselves how many children are willing to use transit to go to school or how safe uh, is transit to women uh, in our cities. And is our transit accessible for physically challenged and the elderly? And infrastructure and design related changes can improve this situation for many users. Similarly, how clear are or how clean our transit vehicles are also influences the use of uh, transit. Unclean transit is unappealing, so it deters uh, people using the transit services. So regular cleaning outside and inside the vehicles can improve uh, this situation. The same applies to our transit stations. The cleaner the transit stations are, a better image that we portray to the transit users. And having amenities like public toilets, feeding rooms and baby rooms especially at connecting stations and interchanges can influence the use of transit. This can be easier when transit interchanges uh, and connection stations are planned as hubs within shopping or retail uh, buildings and other recreational facilities then can be easily included. Also, it can be very frustrating to go to a station and end up on the wrong side of the track, only to realize that either the information shown is incorrect or there is no proper signage to tell you where to go. And this is not the case for motorists. All they have to remember is where they've parked their vehicle and the roads are clearly marked on the directions that they need to take. The equivalent for transit users is to know where to get their bus or train and where to get off. Clear signage, hence, can help people use transit and especially important when changing modes at connections and interchanges. The delay caused by the lack of signage can cost the transit user a trip and a lot of delay. This makes them avoid transit altogether. Facilities such as mobile phone charging on board of uh, transit vehicles and having information display systems on board and providing wireless connections can also increase the quality of service for, for the transit users. And once your user is on the vehicle, the way the vehicle is driven and the attitude of the driver and their etiquette can make a strong impression and can also influence the perception of safety for the user. Providing proper driver training and regular trainings on how to conduct themselves with customers can also be a great help. Also an important thing to note is not stressing out the drivers with long working hours, but rather using shifts and this will ensure that the drivers also get sufficient rest that they require. We should not ignore that transit users are also customers of the transit agency. So the more the customer likes the product, the more they will use it or buy it. Similarly, maintaining the quality of the service ensures reliability. With proper timetables and operations, the system can be on time and hence increase the reliability or trust for the public transport user. The vehicles should not only arrive at the station on time, but also leave the stations on time. An example for this uh, is train operations in Japan, where there are cases where tra rail operators issued an apology for a train being 20 seconds early. I repeat, 20 seconds early. Also in Japan, if the train is delayed by five or more minutes, you can get a train delay certificate which can prove that your delay was caused because of the public transport. And this certificate can be given to uh, your boss or to the school administration 
to justify being late. Yet, in order not to be so extreme as Japan, another way of addressing the issue is also notifying the passengers beforehand of any delays. This can be done easily with the use of technology, sending a notification on the transit app or displaying a sign at the station can help passengers plan their trip and make any changes if needed. Answering customers' queries is also an important aspect in maintaining the reliability. Having a central call center for customer queries helps a lot. This number should be able to also offer route guidance to passengers who are not into technological solutions, especially the elderly. Further, catering for people with special needs also shows that the system considers the needs of all its users.